it's a great honour to be asked to kind of do this. Um, and I've been spending kind of the last sort of 10 days or so kind of worrying at the edges of this problem and trying to kind of understand what it really means and, and, and what should I tell you and what would you kind of want to hear and I played around with fun ideas like not turning up at all and sort of playing that fun game. You could all sit here and sort of have a nice little artistic think about what, what that would mean. But instead, I was reading the papers at the weekend um, and because it's, you know, eight minutes past nine on a Friday morning and the weekend is upon us, I want to just briefly talk about the act of self-immolation. I want to talk about Mohammed Bouazizi, who on the 10th of December 2010 was so outraged and disgusted at continual police oppression that he took himself in front of the city hall in Tunis and he poured a can of petrol over himself and he set fire to himself. And he burnt, screaming and dying as a public act of defiance against a state that was continuously oppressing those who just wanted to be free. And I want us just to have a tiny moment, and not too much of a moment, but I just want you to take just a fraction of a second to appreciate how insanely transgressive that act is. This is not taking a bottle of sleeping pills. This is not drinking too much whiskey. This is not smoking yourself silently to death. This is standing in a public place and picking up that can and pouring that over yourself and then lighting a match, knowing full well all you're about to experience is incredible agony in the hope that you will pass out. And just take a tiny moment to think about at what moment in your life would you be willing to take that act? In 1968, Paris students dug the cobbles up on the streets and threw them at the police. This was Soissons Houtard. This was the great last leftist act. It was the kind of final mainstays of the Marxist revolution. It was really the moment by which the left really tried to define itself once finally against the sort of oppressive sort of capitalistic system of which these students believed in. It also demarcated the first moment of postmodernity in lots of ways. It was really the established elite and the intellectuals transgressing against a system that they themselves had previously been working for, operating by and funded. It was a, an act of huge defiance um, that is still kind of not understood to these days. I don't really know why my landlord is calling me now. Um, and the next year, something incredible happened, something that I believe in and gives me great hope. In 1969, an interface message protocol system, commonly referred to as an IMP, sent the first message between UCLA and Stanford. It was only 150 miles. And the first message ever sent across the internet was hell. Uh, the zero got lost, um, someone had managed to disconnect the wire in the final moment, but hell was appeared on this screen, very different to this screen obviously, um, and that was the first moment that a computer had talked to another computer. And whilst it was only one point to one point, it began something, and it began a dissolution of hierarchy that was previously hitherto impossible. And once we had two machines, we had five machines, and then we had nine machines, and then we had 10 and 20, and now it is an exponential rate of growth whereby estimations of things coming online is anywhere between 10 to 15 million devices every single day becoming online. This is an insane number. And this opens up a real chance for rebellion. It opens up an opportunity for network effects. It gives us an opportunity to go around problems in new and interesting ways. We no longer are living in a world which is a, a one-to-many broadcast scenario. We no longer have to accept hierarchy that comes from above. We no longer have to organise ourselves in standard, strict ways. And hopefully, we no longer have to pour petrol over ourselves to make ourselves heard or to make our points clear. We no longer have to dig up cobblestones and throw them at the face of the police to make our things known. And what I kind of really want to inspire you to try and think about as you go through your lives is what are you actually going to do with the power that's been given to you? What are you actually going to act and make? What are the things that you see as personal injustices, professional injustices? What are you going to do to reorganise and recalibrate and retranspose this existence that we find ourselves in? 
Are you happy with the way that immigrants are being treated in the UK? Are you happy with the way that homosexuals are being treated? Are you happy the way that your children are being educated? Are you happen, happy in the ways that chemicals are entering into your food? Are you happy with a political system that seems to favour the elite over the working people? And if you are unhappy with any of these injustices, what are you going to do apart from just disregard them? What are you going to do apart from have another drink and, and bitch with your, and moan with your friends, given the great power that you have, given the great opportunities, living in one of the greatest cities in the world, with a great system. Um, my flat's just gone on the market. My bloody landlord's selling it from underneath me. Rage, revolution. Anyway, um, that's quite distracting, actually. Um, all of us have this great power and opportunity. And yet, not many of us seem to be that content with our lives. We don't seem to feel as though we have enough time for our friends. We don't seem to feel as sometimes that our professional career, especially if you're a freelancer, is going the way you want it to. Sometimes we don't feel as though we're connecting meaningfully to each other. Sometimes, it, for me personally, it feels as though we're consistently putting a screen in the way of where human interaction should be. We're constantly staring at the damn device. We're constantly looking at the black mirror. And how do we move beyond this? How do we create all of this opportunity, all of this chance, all of this creativity, all of this hope, all of this positivity that can be a non-violent act, an act of pure creation, an act of trying to do something meaningful? One of the things I've been looking at recently is the creation of a free school for 16 to 19-year-olds. Now, I made the, the personal uh, recent rebellious act of deciding to work for a government that I don't agree with. Uh, and I decided to do that because some of the policies that were being put in place by the Conservatives I did agree with. Not all of them, uh, certainly not ones regarding immigration. Um, but on technology and supporting entrepreneurship and supporting the idea of opening up uh, state school education to give the opportunities of private-led techniques and methods, I support them on. And I believe that these things are the right things to do. And I've been thinking a lot about how education in the UK, again, fits into this hierarchy. There's a one-to-many scenario. And whilst it's ridiculous for me to sort of be in this one-to-many broadcast scenario and to tell you how stupid that is, I've been looking around something called the Harkness Method of, of Teaching. The Harkness Method of Teaching is a 10-to-1 uh, scenario. You basically have a facilitator and then 10 pupils who sit around a table and they discuss. Everything is a discussion-led basis. It is, again, a many-to-many -many hierarchy. It is a situation where the, the facilitator and teacher is there really to coach out the topics of conversation, not to just tell or inform or to be wrote down or just uh, put in a book, but to really genuinely pull out these people and pull out their emotions and their feelings. And what it does is it tends to create quite interesting and powerful individuals who have the ability to not only think for themselves but also reason and criticise quite... Um, sort of poignantly and quite sort of powerfully, just because they're very used to the idea of having to actually discuss openly and, and, and debate. One of their most noticeable alumni comes from Exeter College in the States, uh, is, is a well-known chap, Mark Zuckerberg, who's seemingly doing okay with a little app that he built, and uh, over in Wellington College. And by using, um, effectively, uh, a government's policy that goes against not only my parents' teaching, my own teaching, also by a Conservative government that I disagree with very, very strongly on many topics, I am trying to rebel against an education system that, that failed me. Uh, I have one A-level, never went to university, um, and it consistently is a source of shame for me um, about how poor my academic record is. It really upsets me. And um, I've recently been uh, going through some discussions about, about how that actually kind of makes me feel. It made me realise that, again, for me, it comes down to this idea of hierarchy. It comes down to this system of which we have to place ourselves into, this system of success. And at no point, at any point, did I find in my education system, nor do I find within a government system currently, that there is this dialogue, that there is this many-to-many -many scenario. Everything is very rigid and very, very structured. And so, when thinking about rebellion and thinking about the education system, thinking about the government, it only really leaves me to, to, to remark on one person, um, which is Henry David Thoreau, who wrote Civil Disobedience uh, in the 18th century. 
It says, if it's the machine of government is of such a nature that it requires you to be an agent of injustice to another, then I say break the law. And I agree with that. And this is, this is almost 200 years old. This is when a state system was very, very small. Um, Thoreau believes that the, a, government, a, a government governs best when it governs least. I'm not sure I agree with that in all capacities. But what I would like you to think about is at some moment today, maybe Monday, Tuesday, work out a moment of injustice, a moment where you're being forced to do something you don't quite agree with. And just take a tiny moment to react in some meaningful way to that. Whether that just be to voice your concern, whether it should be raise a dialogue with someone, whether it should be send a snarky, passive-aggressive tweet into the, uh, the, the spaces between us. Or maybe, just maybe, do something truly radical. Do something incredibly dangerous and incredibly bold. Stand for MP. Write to your MP. Phone them up. Tweet them. Talk to them. But begin a dialogue about politics, begin a dialogue about education, begin a dialogue about the future and your own self and how you're going to position that. Because it's just far too easy, I think, in the modern life just to conform completely to the ways and systems of which we inherit, that the media continue to perpetuate, that we continue to perpetuate ourselves through what unfortunately amounts to um, laziness and, and, and massive insecurity on ourselves. And we have the world's greatest self-organising, bypassing network system that comes out of revolution. It comes distinctly out of leftist Marxist, non-hierarchical, postmodern terms. And we have a huge opportunity as workers and agents of the digital age to really ensure that we stand for what we really want this to be what future we're trying to create. And that's all I want you to do. I don't want you to um, do anything but participate. And uh, there's no real act of rebellion, actually. I want you to conform into a democracy, and I want you to conform into a system that is pre-existing. But I want you to do the most aggressively, beautifully creative act, which is to start a conversation with yourself about what the future looks like for you. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Mm. So, kind of seeing it as an MBA for young people, um, the aim is to celebrate digital creative entrepreneurship for 16 to 19 year olds. Uh, so they will, um, it's effectively a, a sixth form, um, initially we think 100 children, and they will come in and they will be taught the sort of fundamentals of uh, design, uh, of public speaking, of uh, coding, of development, project management, and the aim really is to be able to take the children that would ordinarily have gone, done an arts degree and then had to retrain and ended up finally in a digital marketing agency is to try and get these into uh, meaningful employment around the age of sort of 18, 19, working with um, direct partners, working with um, trade organisations to try and create the sort of skills that we actually need in the modern digital age without people having to go and spend £35,000 at university or uh, do an 8,000 GA course or whatever it be, but to try and provide that opportunity for them. Um, we're looking at trying to find ways that we can interface meaningfully with investment. I, my, my sort of measure of success would be to produce some sort of children that come out that actually have uh, an investable idea and actually to basically build their career from that very start. Um, we will see what happens. I mean, DfE, we apply in May. Um, we'll see what the Department for Education thinks of, of what is a fairly wacky idea. Um, civil servants are not really known for being massively wacky. Um, they tend, to, well, they sometimes have comedy uh, ties and socks, but uh, that's about as wacky as they get. So these ideas of, of especially um, a dialogue-led education system, I think is gonna be a, a bit of a challenge, but we'll see. We'll see, you never know, they might, they might surprise me. They have done before. The, the people at number 10 are some of the smartest and hardest working people I've ever had the fortune to work with. Uh, every single one of them is dedicated to trying to make a better Britain. Um, and that actually, whilst I think lots of them have um, inherited uh, background and elitism issues and, and certainly are overeducated and uh, probably inbred in many ways, um, <laughs> they are doing something that is deeply humbling and it is, um, it's inspiring to see people working so hard to try and make a, a, a better future for us, whether you agree with the reality of how that plays out or not. I, it is a distinct and, and uh, marked contrast from what the press and MPs would have you believe about who they are and, and what they stand for.
Um, and it was, yeah, it was an experience I will, I will honour for the rest of my life. I was very, 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 very fortunate. And, you know, we did some really interesting policy work. We did some really great law changes. We've managed to re reject several EU uh, privacy laws that would have massively impacted the growth of uh, technology in the UK. Um, you know, but there's lots to be done. The NHS is being slowly unpicked around the edges and it took, you know, 25 years to, to create it and it will take 25 years to unpick it. But, you know, there's lots that is not okay within politics and I find that's, I think, the most interesting thing about it is it's not black or white in any way. And you can be this, you know, socialist sort of free market sort of anarcho-capitalist, NHS-loving, sandal-wearing, vegetarian beef farmer, and your views are still valid. And it's crazy, but it's kind of a beautiful thing. And something that the press, I think, especially, and, and increasingly generations from, from my age and below, are becoming apathetic to. Um, and I think that's really dangerous. I think that's really scary. Because when you have political apathy, you effectively end up with fascism. Um, and that's the scariest thought of all. I mean, I think, as, as is true there, it's true everywhere. Finding allies, finding people who uh, understand your vision, often when you're, when you're trying to sell ideas in, in, in any capacity, unless you can find another group of people who also get that vision, you can then work together. Um, so the idea of, of, of having multiple people selling your vision and, and, and evolving that and, and taking that sort of Hofstadter sort of strange loops idea is really useful. Um, and I think that's, that's the trick, finding people who you know agree with you and, and using them and working with them. Um, because it's, it's kind of funny to talk about this in re, sort of the, you know, the, the trick of rebellion is not to not rebel, is to actually kind of not fight all the time um, and actually to work with people is far more effective and far more... Um, it took me about six months to understand that, and I, was, I spent so long shouting at people and, and getting really frustrated with people who were 50 who didn't understand what the internet was. Um, and it was a waste of time. I gave myself severe heart palpitations, just with sheer anger and frustration. Um, and then you just start to realise there's, again, you know, like the network system, like the internet, there's multiple ways to the same end point. You can go around things these days. Um, and that's what I learned. So we need to get rid of the sort of bipartisan approach uh, of, of both the Conservatives and Labour. Um, so there needs to be a new political party uh, that is dedicated to the idea of um, local meaningful uh, change. Um, cities need to have uh, far more powers devolved back to them. Uh, a country that is governed from the heart will only ever become weak. Um, I think we need to start the point of the getting children, especially children involved in education and uh, politics, a lot, lot earlier. Um, in France, you know, they, I think it really matters that they, they teach philosophy at such a young age and they start that conversation. And in the UK, we, got, we don't have that conversation. Sort of politics, religion, philosophy, the three sort of most important things to think about in your life are the things you're not allowed to talk about in the UK. They're the things you're barred from talking about and are the sorts of things that will you know, get you punched in a pub. And, and I think that just shows a, a sort of... I don't know, like a lack of intellectual backbone in the UK, and I don't like it, and it upsets me. But I don't really know. I think, you know, I think we need to organise around what we believe Britain to be and, and what do we want to keep. And you know, for me, that's free education for all. It's the NHS. It's trying to you know, let the state do what only the state can do in its best way possible, um, but not really to try and do that much more. I, I, I want Manchester to, to run Manchester. I, I want Liverpool to run Liverpool. I want them to to do that in, the, in, the, in a meaningful way, um, instead of London just gathering all the money and dishing it out. Um, but again, we will, I don't think we'll see any of these political parties willfully want to unpick their own power structures. I think that's just, you know, it's a bit like when pop eats itself, it's just a very odd thing. Cameron's never going to run on a, on a ticket, which is, why don't I not be PM? It doesn't make any sense for them. But I do think there is, there's, there is future in localism, for sure. Um, I mean, you know, they play multiple roles, and I think, I think, you know, meaningful job creation, as in jobs that people want to do, rather than manufacturing jobs or being a condom tester or a sausage pricker or whatever the sort of other horrendously industrialised existences that we have. Um, I think creating jobs that, that are creative, that are meaningful, that are, that are somehow digitally enabled, you know, 
It's a really exciting time. You could be a you know, community manager for a really cool startup, and your job is to sit on Twitter and send people T-shirts. Like, what a great gig! Like, that's a really fun thing to do. Like, you get to learn lots of, about people. Um, so I think that's where entrepreneurship kind of fits in, which is which is trying to create some sort of value, but also doing things differently. You know, reorganizing structures, you know, trying to do away with management, trying to do away with hierarchy. Um, and I think that's, that, again, the only thing that can come out of, of local individual action. They're doing it right in terms of trying to, you know, trying to create meaningful policies and, and, and tax reliefs for creative and digital entrepreneurship. I think that's really useful. Um, you know, the SEIS and EIS scheme, 50% tax um, relief to, to, to high net worths makes a, an investable landscape. I think that was a really good, good act. Um, I think they are failing in really putting computers in the heart of, of, of education. Um, so it's still, you know, you have 30 children who walk into a, a room and then they're, they're asked to dis, you know, <laughs> disconnect and unplug from, from the real world. They're asked to put their phone away and actually that's the most powerful computer in the, in the room and then they're forced to sit down in neat little rows and listen to people and um, be taught things that are kind of could be could be communicated and educated so much better, I think, with with machines. Um, Steve Jobs used to say that you know, the computer is a bicycle for the mind, and it is. But we need to get that into the heart of education. It's it's not history and then computing. It should be history that has computers in it, and we should be using iPads and engaging multimedia content and building things and looking at how the curriculum is is powered by and used for the internet. How does Facebook play into that? How does Twitter play into that? But I think that's the, what we're seeing is, unfortunately, there is a generation of, of teachers who have never been taught computing or computers or, or digital skills. So it's all very sort of backwards. You have this incredibly digitally literate society who are being taught by the digitally illiterate about the future instead of what should be happening as an inverted version of that. You know, the children should be teaching the adults at this point about what is coming and, and how that works. So I think we're failing there. Um, I think we're failing to use technology to reduce the costs of government um, effectively. So the NHS in the recent malarkey regarding care data. Um, you know, when you start realising the waste that the taxpayer uh, is afforded um, by companies such as BT and others on IT infrastructure that is designed to, to save people's lives, it becomes deeply, deeply offensive. So in 2010, we paid BT 9 billion of our taxpayers' money for a project they did not deliver. I, I would love to be paid 9 billion for doing nothing. That would be incredible. So there's some really fundamental structural problems about that. Um, so I think those are the sorts of things. But trying to, again, you know, this is, as we used to say in government, the last government that doesn't understand the internet. You know, some of them got it not all of them, and weirdly, Osborne, despite being distinctly unlikable on TV, is a programmer by training. He's actually quite an okay person, which is a shock uh, when you see him on TV. He just has one of those unfortunate faces that tends to get captured looking like an absolute idiot. Um, so I think we will see that change come, but it's still not enough, and it's still a huge disconnect from our day-to-day -day existences and our lives and the tools we use in... Um, day to day, I mean, you know, the idea of bringing your own device in a, in, in a government shop is just unheard of. So everyone's still got these clunky desktops and horrible Windows 95 machines and faxes in the corner and, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't run a sandwich shop without technology, let alone a country. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, these are the sort of problems, they're just not really investing in it and there's this fear because, as, you know, it reminds me of my father sort of 15 years ago, that fear of upgrading technology in case it becomes meaningless or, you know, so we need to invest deeply in it. We need to fucking sort our broadband out. That really winds me up. Um, you know, and, and again, BT, fucking BT, you know, had not delivering on a promise that they, they should have done for 2012. You know, we should have, we're the densest, smallest populated little country on earth. We're, you know, 175 miles from the sea at all moments. It's not a big place and somehow they can't put fibre optic in Bath or they can't get it to Cornwall. You know, we can lay it across 
the Atlantic and we can send people into space, but apparently we can't plug a cable in. It's annoying. So those are the sorts of things that really need to be looked at. And 5G Wi-Fi as well, I'm trying to create that. Can I go now? No. <laughs> we have one more question. I think the statement that we're sleepwalking into surveillance state is probably the most true. Um, and I think it's absolutely outrageous that we're not uh, on the streets right now demanding our rights back. Um, it's massively offensive uh, that we are um, so apathetic to being monitored and tracked and surveilled. Um, every single one of your emails sits in a file somewhere to be read and to be judged and to be discussed, you know, discussed later and, and to maybe even retrospectively uh, be found to be illegal if they change the laws on you. And that's a hugely dangerous and scary uh, place. Um, and I think it's outrageous that we're not angry. And I, um, you know, with you know, when you have journalists who are willfully hacking voicemails, you have um, governments who are willfully hacking their own people. Um, for us to kind of not be rioting and looting on the street, I think, is a bizarre and strange place. Um, and I urge you all very strongly to at least look at some basic encryption or some sort of tour-like existence and uh, just. Be aware that you are unfortunately now just bleeding data that someone will either monetize or decide is um, a criminal offense and uh, we could all end up in the gulags because we once sent a tweet to Piers Morgan calling him a cock. Okay, you can go now. Thanks. <laughs>